This program began as a um, brainstorm when I first met Dan Tarpey, who I will soon introduce. And after an hour and a half conversation, and I say conversation lightly because it was mostly Dan telling me amazing stories, it didn't take a lot of brain power for me to say, would you like to do this with, for the community and share this information? And he said, of course, naturally. So then I thought of Tim Huffman, who had that same space in Tremont Center. It was a street over from me. And I said to Tim, would you like to share some of your stories with the community from that space? And he said, of course, of course I will. And then, naturally, as we've all been anticipating, we think of Rob Littleton. And same question, would you like to, at this point, share what will become in that space? And he said, of course. They are all honored to be with us today. And I think it's that emotion that we feel from that space in Tremont Center and that we'll share with these three amazing gentlemen today. So let me first uh, introduce Dan Tarpey, who will come up. Dan is um, the son of Tom Tarpey, who started Tarpey's Market. He worked in that uh, business till 1986 when they sold it. And then he became a beer and wine distributor. So if you have beer or wine questions later, he, he certainly knows, for 30, almost 30 years. And now he's a part-time development officer at St. Charles Preparatory School. And he is uh, with us today to share his story. So let's welcome Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. I appreciate the nice introduction and looking forward to sharing with you the history not only of the store but of uh, a key member of the family that started the business and that's my father and I'm gonna start with the uh, first store when I do this I want to give you a little background so dad was working for the Kroger company in the 30s all throughout the 30s um, and his last store that he managed was on Grandview Avenue in the early 40s and he was going up the ranks with Kroger and had a nice, really nice following at the Kroger store in Grandview with customers. And I think Dad, talking with Dad over the years, he felt there was a vision he had in the Marble Cliff, Tri-Village, Upper Arlington community of, of bringing foods in from around the world that he felt his customers would appreciate, that he didn't have that opportunity when he was working at Kroger. So in 1943, when the war, in the midst of the war, that was the same year he got married, and I'm one of nine children. My sister Margie and my sister Liz are here today, and my grandson Jack are here today. So um, in 43, Dad opened Apex Market at 2116 Arlington Avenue in the Mallway, which is now cover to cover bookstore. Yeah, a little tidbit there. It's about 1,100 square feet. It was all charge account, full charge account and delivery store. You would walk in. Uh, the, the people behind the counter would wait on you, put them in a, a bag. It was completely 100% service in that regards. And they would cut your meat, hand cut to order. Uh, and you would either leave with the product or you could call it in earlier that day and they would deliver it to your home. And the, the bulk of the business here was being conducted with people who lived within about a mile radius of this store, which would put us Marble Cliff, north, Marble Cliff from the south, Lane Avenue to the north, and to the east would be Star Road. Customers would come over, and to the west would be Route 33 or Riverside Drive. That was the nucleus of the customer base for this store. And Dad hired two or three butchers, and he, he right away developed his business. A lot of the strength of the business was centered around produce and meat. And, and the meat that he carried was, the beef he carried was USDA Prime exclusively. And uh, it was carried at this store from the very beginning. And it sort of, you'll know in years that would go by, he would carry that on as well up to Tremont. 
Yeah, yeah if you would, do next slide. Do I have the uh, clicker with it's me? Right oh, you have it, okay. I'm gonna go to the next slide and get, get, there's dad right there. That's a wonderful picture of him. That's from about 1959 in the Citizen Journal. Uh, they wrote a column, Leaders in Business, Tarpey, David Among, Grocery, Goliath. So a little background on that comment of David Among. So Columbus was, at that point, uh, had a lot of major stores, with Big Bear being the kingpin. Wayne Brown, who lived in Arlington, founded Big Bear in 1932. His original store was on Lane Avenue, across from Ohio State, in the old, uh, yeah. So Dad and Wayne Brown were good friends. So that gives you some background that Big Bear, Kroger, A&P, there was a Piggly Wiggly, believe it or not, one Piggly Wiggly around still. Albers, a colonial store was their parent company. Albers had stores in Columbus, Super Duper. There were IGAs. At, when I first went to work for Dad in the mid-60s, there were about 165 independent grocers in Columbus in the Yellow Pages. They were under banners like Royal Blue. They were under banners like Super Duper, IGA. Or they, were, they just had their own name um, and didn't use a banner. The banner meaning that whoever their wholesaler was, they would align up with the wholesaler. So this again was like 1959. This, this is where we bought our beef. This was uh, the kind of beef we bought. We bought cattle after it was dressed out they were aged in the cooler. That happens to be Dad and Bill Sullins. Bill was our beat manager at Tremont. So this was probably in the mid-50s. This would be one week's worth of supply. Wow. And the, we had six butchers, and they would break these down into front quarters and hind quarters. Once you broke them down that way, you would then break down the, you would break the rib, you'd pull the rib out for your Delmonico steaks. You'd pull your... Uh, on the hindquarter side, you'd, you'd put T-bone, porterhouse, sirloin steaks in the counter. That's what you get off the hindquarter. And, of course, you'd, you'd, you could, we did buy a lot of whole beef tenderloins at that juncture, along with whole New York strips. So the beef business was very robust. Most of the, our competition uh, were carrying USDA choice. So, Dad, uh, we had a couple relationships here in town. This came from David Davies which was down in the south end off of Route 315. It's not, no longer there. Later, we formed a relationship with Dick and Chuck Falder, Village Packing Company, where we bought all of our beef. We bought all the hindquarters um, we could, and the front quarter business that we couldn't use, which is your chuck roast and your English, would go to Martin's Market out on the east side in Bexley, where he had a kosher meat store and he sold all the front quarters. So we had a really nice relationship there where he would take the front quarters, we would take the hind quarters. But this was about 35% of our total sales. And at the time at Tremont, when we first opened, uh, it was 10,000 square feet. And we belonged, to a comp we belonged to an organization called National Association of Retail Grocers. And at, for four or five years in a row, the store led the country in, in sales per square foot. Now that's important because it was only 10,000 square feet, but the sales we were doing out of that store, right over here, was the largest per square foot in the country of all grocers who reported to Nargis. Nargis was the acronym for National Association of Retail Grocers. So uh, I got the clicker. <laughs> let me let me keep going. This is our first time we had a Tremont. This is a nighttime view of the neon sign. You could see it from the TWA flying over our own. It was uh, as impressive as it was at night. It was pretty pretty large. I don't know that it would pass zoning today. So dad was down in the hallway. He also opened another apex market in the early in the mid forties in Grandview called Grandview Apex, and it was on First Avenue. Well, Dad sold that in the late 40s to Dick Massanelli. Dick kept it as Apex. When Dad moved to Tremont, he dropped the name Apex, and he put his last name up on the front. So 
Uh, that was about the time, 1953. So you've spent 10 years on the Mallway in, and in Grandview. And then he moved to Tremont. I want to share with you that when he moved, to, when he was telling customers he was going to move to Tremont, many, many of the customers, uh, I was mentioning this earlier, would say, Tom, I don't know if people are going to drive that far. <laughs> and I thought, Dad used to tell me, I thought I was telling him we're going to go to Cleveland. I mean, they, some ladies said I'm going to have to pack a snack or, you know. But uh, it was a little bit of a, a stretch because there wasn't a lot going on North Lane Avenue. Uh, in terms, other than Onondaga and Can Canterbury, probably um, Abington, those streets were developed. But from Tremont Center North, it was just a lot of vacant land, which later became, some of that later became Kingsdale Shopping Center. So uh, this is now 53. This is the front of the store during the day, and that's an April Fool sale. These are people waiting to go into the tent, or they're shopping, one or the other. Uh, to go in the tent for the April Fool breakfast. We, we started that, Dad started that, and that became a tradition that lives on with Tim, and it lived on, uh, or should be, I think the center's still promoting it every year, so it it's continues, it hasn't stopped. We had Aunt Jemima one year come in, and she flipped uh, pancakes for us. Yeah, I, I don't know that we could pull that off today, but, but those are the kind of things, Dad was such an innovator, he was very creative. Um, he thought outside the box, and he, he had a little bit of Barnum and Bailey mixed in with being a merchant. He truly valued being a merchant, and being a merchant to dad was thinking outside the box. What, what can we bring that they haven't tried? So he would bring things in like Sarah Lee, okay? And Sarah Lee was turned down by the chain stores, so dad was sort of like a, a guinea pig for Sarah Lee. He was the same thing with Stouffer's. Stouffer's got turned down from Big Bear and Kroger because they said it's too expensive. It's three for a dollar for macaroni and cheese. And Dad said, no, we'll try it. And we'll try your other things. They made a lot of nice things besides macaroni and cheese back then. They made lobster Newburgh. They made um, short ribs of beef. I can think of Thomas English muffins. There's a lot of things. Mike sells potato chips. A lot of brands would knock on our door and say, would you mind giving us a chance? And Dad knew that if it went well at our store, that it would be just be a matter of time, they're gonna to come to dad and ask him if he would relinquish the exclusivity of it. And they would call him Big Bear and Kroger, and Big Bear and Kroger would take it on. And then we would lose, you know, being exclusive. But for the year or two that we had the exclusive, it worked out really nice on a lot of brands. Wine, we did it with wine. Back in the late 50s, dad brought in a tremendous amount of, of imported wine, along with domestic. Uh, from California and featured it and we had tastings and we did things that today I guess we all take for granted but back then he was certainly a pioneer because nobody was doing it. Italian Swiss Colony and Gallo were the only two brands so for him to bring in these unusual brands uh, was a little bit of a stretch for him but he, he was didn't mind taking it because he felt he had the customer base that would This is our ad, probably at uh, Apex Market, probably in the late 40s, uh, 2116 Arlington Avenue. You can see there Tom Tarpey's Apex. Uh, the Grand High State Fair, 1952, no, so it's 1952, excuse me. High State Fair, prize beef. Dad purchased it, we would promote that. Later, we would do it with lamb, and we would be called Lamarama, and we would feature lamb promotions along uh, with the High State Fair beef. And that became quite a, an attraction that people waited on to fill their freezers. I want to test all your memories a little bit here. This is back when, look at these prices. USDA prime center cut chuck roast, 69 cents a pound. Ground beef, 59. Uh, you can see up here, green giant corn, five cans for a dollar. Florida gold orange, this is frozen orange juice, not fresh frozen orange See, they pioneered frozen orange juice because Fresh, they didn't, ha they didn't know back then how to stabilize it. So it was frozen. Florida Gold happened to be a brand name. Bird's Eye really started it, along with Minute Maid. Bing Crosby made a lot of money. He invested in Minute Maid uh, when they went out with frozen orange juice. So another thing here I want to point out is all this beef, most of it was, was hand-cut, and it was freezer-wrapped. Remember the white 
paper. Okay, you don't see that too much anymore, but that was because homes to people's homes or you know, a high quarter or a side or any kind of meat they wanted we would we would double wrap it in freezer paper this is the store grand opening at Tremont in 53 where the grocery gondolas and produce it was to be right when you came in the store right when you walked down the aisle there's your produce and it was bigger on the other side than it is there the produce department but that gives you an item this gal, I'll say her name in a minute, of course, she's gone. She's not with us any longer, but she was a wonderful lady. Dad had a knack for really hiring uh, not only wonderful associates, but people that were, were customer conscious. They were customer driven. Uh, the personal touch was very important to Dad. He tried to, he always made it, it was somewhat second nature to him to be out in front and personable. But I think our employees picked up on that as well. And so they of that, and I can't, I'll say her name before the, I get finished here, but it might be Martha. <laughs> this is the dairy aisle. No, frozen food. This is frozen food. This is the, uh, the, the outside aisle as you come down, and the checkout counters are right here, started right in this area. You can see the cart coming up. You can see the flowers. That's what the vendors would give us, or any store for, for that matter on day of grand opening, your people that we did business with. This 10,000 square feet, and that store, I tell you, was a little band box, but it really, really turned out the business, especially during the holidays or 4th of July week in Upper Arlington. That might as well be a, 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 a holiday. It is a holiday, but it might as well, it's, it's right up there with Christmas. Okay, so we started Tremont. The, 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 the stamps back in the day, trading stamps, were where you would save a book of stamps and you'd bring them in and get $3 off your bag of groceries, off your next uh, grocery order. So uh, people would trade them in or we'd give them two twenty five dollars in cash. And uh, after we sold the store in 1986, I still to this day get people saying, my mom passed away, I'm in her attic, and I found all these tarpy stamps. <laughs> And I said, well, if you're decorating your rec room, you might want to make a collage. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to do. Uh, maybe, guess what? Maybe Rob Littleton will give you th $3 off. So in 1959, after we were six years at Tremont with the grocery store, we developed the wine business really, really well, along with delicatessen items. We didn't have enough room for deli. We didn't have enough room to expand our wine. So dad, six blocks north, was the first merchant to sign a lease with the Upper Arlington Company, which was um, the developer of Tremont. They developed Kingsdale. And we opened Tarpey's Beverage and Delicatessen, right? You can see where the water tower is. Many of you probably remember it. And to the left of it, as you were looking on, would have been the state liquor store, which was the number one state liquor store for 20 years in the state of Ohio. <laughs> Good things to eat and drink from all around the world. That was our motto at that store. That was our, uh, we copyrighted this. We, uh, Dad felt very uh, good about the fact that we were being able to expand the wine department. We hired a Frenchman who moved to Columbus to be with his grandchildren out of Bordeaux, and he wore a little chapeau, and we put him in the wine aisle. And he did a great job, a wonderful job. We put us on the map with wine, uh, or he continued to put us on the map. We had a, this is where we expanded the deli into party trays for, for tailgate parties. We had cheese balls, we had bar cheese, we had uh, meat, meat trays, cheese trays that were ready prepared. You call in, you'd come in the side door and pick them up. And then we'd, you, we had a big, big beer cooler in the back. A lot of people, it was a service beer, beer cooler where you could walk in and pick out your own beer. This store also had a pickle barrel where we had fresh pickles, uh, kosher pickles we brought in from Paramount. And uh, those were two for a dollar. No, no, two for 50 cent. But those are little things I can remember. This is my dad in the, in the uh, early 
70s, they came to dad and they asked him, I remember I was in the meeting with City National Bank, a little name out of the past. They asked dad to be an experiment. Here we, here we go with experimenting. They said, Tom, we have a thing called Master Charge and a thing called Bank, Bank AmeriCard. Would your store be willing to be a trial and you wouldn't take a check from a customer unless you wanted to, but you could also offer this to them and we would stand behind it and collect it. And in return for that, you would have to pay a fee. And dad said, how much? And they said, 3%. And dad said, in the grocery business, you can't pay 3%. Well, we, they, City National ended up charging 1% handling fee for that. Well, that's not a bad deal. But what they wanted, they wanted to see how many customers would stop writing checks and, and go for the plastic. So they issued the plastic to Upper Arlington residents, 43221, 43220, and 43212. They would, in, they would take those zip codes and, and send out master charge and, and uh, what we later call Visa, and then we would take them here at the store. We were the only food store that would take them at the time. Well, we did such a high percentage of our volume with these pl eventually, with the plastic, although it was hard to get people off the of checks, believe it or not. And you, also, you have to remember, we also had our own start, store charge. Well, we couldn't wait to get rid of that because that took up a lot of time. So that was nice to convert a lot of that over to this. Of course, Big Bear came on board, so did Kroger within a year. And now it's commonplace, obviously, everywhere. But that was probably the early 70s. This was the Tremont store in the, well, probably 1968 to 1986 when we sold the store to Cardinal Foods. That's a Nosemobile Cutlass in front. And you can see that, you know, the, the signs in the window was on sale that week. And uh, the, the store, we sold it to Cardinal Foods in 86. The sign um, was probably, as I said, about 12, 13 years as t just Tom Tarpey's. That's dad in the early 60s. And that was taken uh, in one of the, one of the uh, conventions they had in Columbus, one of the grocers conventions. We were members of the Central Ohio Retail Grocers Association and the Ohio Grocers. And they would sometimes have conventions here in town. Dad was, uh, was giving a talk. And that is it. That's the history of Tarpies. I can say I could be up here all day, but I, there's a, a lot to be told. We're going to leave questions and answers to the end. Uh, before I introduce Tim, I just want to say that uh, it was a pleasure and an honor. I see some of our customers out here. I see Don called on us with Procter & Gamble back in the... Back in the day, his mom and dad were really good customers of ours. Um, a lot of you are out in the audience that were customers. And it was a business made up of the personal touch. We tried to, we at least tried to make it that way. You were family, we tried to treat you that way. And um, dad had a saying, I'm gonna leave you with this, that the sweetest sound to a person is the sound of their own name. So he made it a big, point for us to get to know all of our customers by their first and last name and their spouse and their children because he said that's something the other guys can't do or won't do or take the time to do or can't do so we always looked for little niches what the guys around us couldn't do because of their size so take advantage of a small store that's what Rob Littleton's going to continue on with so at this time, I'd like to introduce an old friend, and that is Mr. Tim Huffman, who all of you know as well. And Glenda, his wife, is here with, with Tim. And it's my pleasure. I had, the, uh, I had the pleasure of calling on Tim a little bit with our company. Uh, Kristen mentioned earlier, after, I got, after we sold the store in 86, I was in the wholesale wine distributing business with a company here in town. And... We had a brand, I'll never forget, Tim called me up, I'll say this before I introduce him, called Great Lakes Beer. And it was uh, their Christmas ale. You, you, 
the minute a whole truck would hit the city of Columbus, it'd be gone in a matter of hours. So Tim called me up in his own little quiet manner and said, where's my Great Lakes beer? <laughs> and I made sure he got it. I made sure he got it. <laughs> I took it off of Big Bear's. <laughs> Mr. Tim Huffman. I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It's working? Okay. Anyhow, I'm not a public speaker. I don't have the slideshows. <laughs> I don't know why I have them. I spent an hour on a computer putting this all together today, and uh, it's a mess. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Uh, Fellow Bruce is back in the back door also, Mike Jordan's Mike Debbie. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm sure it's for Dan, but not for me. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, my background is Dan came from a family of nine siblings. I had nine siblings, so I, there were still of us. And uh, my mother and father met in the grocery store. Kind of like my wife and I met in the grocery store. Correct? <laughs> but the difference between them meeting and us meeting is when she met me, my head was wrapped in bandages for all my fisting cup I got in prior to that. And a few stitches just to say, I walked the fight and I woke up. Uh, so anyhow, and somehow she's still here. And uh, but anyhow, uh, I worked at Lawson's, I worked at AMP, I was at AMP down there at the five point from zero. Uh, I love this community. Uh, Things that I can't impress enough is, number one, is my immediate family. My wife and my three children went through pure, pure hell looking for me when was bought the store because I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I always did it for somebody else. And uh, as the weeks went on, there were every Sunday stone cases, uh, trying to get, figure out what I was doing <laughs> and what the lobster changed when I got home. But, uh, it was great. I mean, to me, the most important thing was my family, the employees, and the customers. It wasn't about me, although it seemed to be about me. Without my wife and kids, uh, we would not never gotten to where we had to be. Correct? She won't answer that. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, to my brothers, Joe had the story down going to Avenue. Uh, that was the first stop in this market. And myself and a younger brother uh, went together to see my buying tree one uh, when it was up for sale. And uh, Ray had the money, Joe had the brains, I was the worker. <laughs> and uh, it worked out very well for us. And uh, we ended up having that store, the Three Months store, we had a store in West Road I used to work at. And uh, did things there, but the whole thing is, it's customer relations. Had little bit of customers, goodbye to customers, we help you find them. There's the most important things at all. Just <laughs> think, quit meeting on the podium, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that. Uh, what's that? The people the wheels. We went through three major remodels at the store. All of those, I think, enhanced what we were doing. Uh, we go on different trips uh, in basement grocery stores in Chicago. We saw a tent ceiling, which I loved. So we remodeled the store. Uh, most of the raw ideas, put things together. And, uh, you know, spent a lot of money remodeling the stores. And then you see little folks come in and it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> all of our stuff, all of our stuff, whoever else is in there, and it's gone. It's just like, okay, that's gone. Right. Uh, you know, it's just the way it is. It's progress. And I'm very looking forward to seeing the store, the shopping area to be there. And the uh, biggest thing is for us, was not so much about the store as much as the community to get involved in the community. Um, we did tours of the store for uh, a lot of people, young kids, older people, nursing homes would come in here, schools in the city of Columbus would come in, just take a tour of the store. And uh, we always start off at the uh, produce department, the kitchen, we always start off at the produce department and uh, tell them things you know, going on. Uh, to make an experience for the kids when they came in, so they get over, hopefully they'll come back and shop with us. And uh, we'd go back there, the first thing we'd see is, is there was eight pennies of bananas that I bought, put it out there by the bananas, I thought it was pretty cool. 
And so one day I walked in, I see the name badge, Tim Huffman. <laughs> I always decided to make a name badge. Hey, that'd be a good name for the, for the uh, ape up there. And uh, we tried to make things fun and interesting, and something the kids would remember. And uh, we tell the history of the store so that they would understand it in their words. These are the kindergartens, uh, maybe through fourth, fifth grade. Uh, the schools, Fremont School, Brighton School, uh, Barrington, all the preschools, and uh, things that come to the store with the tools. And when they left there, we always had an old gift for them, an old food tray. We've been together to give to them. Uh, the thing I like to tell them in the courtesy department was all about the bananas and stuff. And uh, I would always tell them, uh, I think there's a young lady in here who told me this one here, but she doesn't know she told me this yet. Her name is Vicki. She's sitting right over here, is that correct? <laughs> and the St. Uh, Mark's Church. And uh, I'd always tell them, not my church, the thing started. I'd always use uh, the person I got it from, as uh, the priest at St. Agatha School, or the principal at Tremont School, depending on who it was. And I'd always say, knock, knock. Who is yeah. there? John. John Josh Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> and it's We showed the different types of fruits and vegetables that were there. We came the back in the back. Uh, we showed them how to cut up a uh, pineapple. And then this pineapple core, which I thought was pretty neat. It's a waste of money for us because we never poured the pineapple out using buy it cheap while we poured it for people. And uh, uh, the, the, the one thing we had at uh, Tremont School, they were studying dinosaurs. I kept saying, like, what can I do to you know, bring dinosaurs into the grocery store? So the kids would come through and you hear them say, wow, look at them. I said, oh my God, it's a dinosaur egg. We took watermelons, cantaloupes, eggs, Everything and made them green and put them there. So we tell them all about the dinosaurs, which I didn't know then, I don't know now. My wife can talk about the dinosaurs she married. The best thing about the sword, I always thought as a good guy, fun guy, likable guy, and then I hired this meat man, six foot six. Yeah. I used to say he was there on three, everybody tell me his name. One, two, three. James. Everybody knows James. Everybody knows James. James was so well liked that during the holidays, I go back in the back, always ask us if you can help him with something. Can you help him with this? Can you help him with that? No, nope, no, nope, just watching. There was Joe just stood there. An hour later, he's still there. Half hour after that, he's still there. Finally, one of my sisters. Is there anyone I can help you with this? He's just standing there. He says, I gotta be honest with you. Every night my wife comes home and all I hear about is James, James, James. <laughs> I want to figure out who this guy is and what our wife's always talking about. That means everybody in our operation, not just the wives, the husbands, the kids, everybody loves James. He's just a super guy. I used to say that James was here and Jesus Christ for <laughs> James was here. Well, James, I think Steve's right beside him because he's just one of the biggest people in the world. And, and like I said, we put the customers going through there and trying to make sure that the customers felt welcome. Uh, they'd ask every employee, you saw an employee, you spoke to them, you asked them if they could help them find, help them with anything, and they want to know where the carrots were. You get told them where the carrots were, but you took them out there to show them where the carrots are. Because even though you can tell them where it is, they don't know the grocery store, they wouldn't be able to find them. And uh, things we had in the store that were fun was the cookie jar. No sugar away from it, different colors in it. Every kid that came in get the cookie jars. And we're away from it, you can eat them. The customers, other customers, all customers come in and eat them. Uh, the spirit ball we had back in the beat department for everybody to play with. And uh, that's kind of a fun thing. And one of the neatest things we ever did was the train. Anybody remember the train? Yeah. yeah. Everybody was crazy about the train, okay? My wife went up to Chicago for a train show. We heard there was going to be a train there. And actually, an advertisement giving. To have Coca Cola pay for the train, Pepsi, chip companies, everybody to buy an advertisement. I says, I'm going to be committed to those people. We just buy it, put it up. We left Chicago on Wednesday, Friday morning. A guy from, uh, oh, can't think where he's from. Anyhow, he was not from Hawaii, he wasn't from Chicago. 
And they uh, came to school up and down Bangor. A week later, the train was up to Bangor, so he had a crew come in and do it. And he didn't stay in business very long, and he didn't collect money up front. And a lot of people, he got our money, but I think a lot of people just did not pay him. And uh, I don't know if the train will ever be seen in another store someplace. It is a lot of work. It has to be cleaned every inch of the train track. It has to be cleaned every week. And uh, it's not cheap. But it's, uh, the main reason for putting up the uh, train was my father in law was a railroad. So we thought it'd be nice to have the caboose and put his name on it. Uh -huh. And I said, well, after you railroaded me and you married his daughter. <laughs> Okay. Oh, so if he was standing up like, who would he 
ground beef. <laughs> uh, it's just ground beef. Uh, what type soup was it? Uh, just a vegetable type soup. We put the thing up and saw the ground I always had a stuffed ground all hanging up. <laughs> Orange? It's corned beef and cabbage. My wife was cooking corned beef and cabbage and have there for a meal. And we couldn't keep it in there. It would just be able to eat for the rest of the week. they come in. I want to know what they could have. And there's one guy there always dressed up for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and uh, that's the second biggest holiday of the year for me yeah. and for my family. April Fool's Breakfast, as it continues, all the things that happened in April Fool's Breakfast, I think it was two years, it was not done, and that was during COVID. They uh, just been for two years. I believe, uh, Rob, you got to go right back. This last past year. Yeah, it was back. Yeah, so it was back, and that is a fun day. Uh, he had a great entertainment. My daughter was always the singer there. She has a beautiful voice. She comes to sing. Now, her daughter will sing. If you want to hire them out, they always will hire them. Uh, the April Fool's breakfast was always on April Fool's Day. But as the families changed, the schools changed, the parents changed, people could not make a dinner. School started early. The young kids get at 6 30, 7 o'clock for breakfast and had to get to school. So, the next thing you know, very few people coming to it. So, we moved into a Saturday. And to me, the lines are still extremely long on Saturday mornings when I see it. And it's a very unique thing. I think this will be the 68th year for having that. Uh, uh, all the things we had to put away in the store, we had a spinning wheel. We could get away stuff out in the tent, we can't get away stuff. The cost to me to get all the stuff away was zero. We had all our vendors to get the stuff. Uh, Smith and Jerry come, they give us the bill, the juice, the type things. Uh, the only thing we had to pay for because it's always the merchants that we're out there working it. And uh, there's different vendors supplying all the uh, drinks, juices, uh, some of gave away toys, uh, whatever it happened to be. It didn't cost us a penny. And I always dressed up different occasions for it, the EDMC, which they never had before, which they need to have again next year. <laughs> and uh, March, April Fool's Breakfast. Uh, How many remind me about the cows? Oh, 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 oh. It's in here. I haven't got that for yet. I told you. Cows, goats, other animals. We had farm animals and stuff. Cows. The first year I did it, we had Elsie Bull from from Borden's. It used to be a big thing here. I'm sure everybody has heard of them. Still, Elsie's still a picture of the board and trucks when you see them. And uh, we had Elsie Bull at the store. <coughs> we had the store. We had by the third case register inside the store. And these cows were immaculate. There were two farmers there. They had a boom shovel to catch any droppings. They had a bucket there. And they were on it like this. They sprayed whatever. And one gentleman who came to the store came in one day and uh, Went up, he says, uh, you know, this is against the law. You can't have animals in the store. I said, don't know anything about it. He says, well, somebody needs to call the health department. You get this taken care of. The phone's right over there. You want to catch somebody on a Saturday? Try to. It won't be there. And we have had instances where people carry dog, have brought dogs in the store where they shouldn't have. And the health department, if they don't see it, it's already gone. They can't do a thing about it. So, yeah, you see it. You so, get stuff. You do away with it. You guys. Get away lottery tickets. Yeah. When the lottery's over, you better cut me off all the time. I'm not cutting. I've got two guns. I have three babies here.
Although now we just give them back to the kids and they donate them to where they want to donate them to. But uh, now we go further. And the last thing I will discuss very quickly. Oh no. Grocery store bingo. Best idea in the world. I believe my wife came up with it. I always have some type of costume on of some sort. And Gus's be in line, especially Thanksgiving, day before Thanksgiving, or a couple days before Thanksgiving, and Christmas. And my wife made these index cards. The first person pull our chicken out of the cart, hold it up. Nobody does it. Hold up this. It kept working different lines. Cranberry sauce. So we held it up. Come on up here, bring up your groceries. The groceries were free. I was at doing it again. One day to do it. You can get me. She like $175 worth of groceries. I says, hey, that's just what we do. And uh, that was it. Sounds like August with the fingers, we had a great time in August, getting back to September, getting back to school. October was Halloween. And I always dress up in some type of costume, and most of the employees in the store always dressed up in some kind of We sold up a thousand turkeys for Thanksgiving, uh, tenderloins, at Christmas time. We would then waste store it all to charge uh, beef tenderloins at what they cost us. Okay? And we also the 899, 799, where we can get 399, okay? So you can't make any money on them. You got these ones in the store. And I will wrap it up there. There's much more here I can say. I thank all of you for being here. And Rob Littlejud, who I've never met before in my life, <laughs> is here. I'm looking forward to seeing great things at the store. And uh, I love what I've seen so far. And I hope you'll see more today. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're going to switch mics here for the... I also want to mention that um, Tim Huffman was the first uh, winner of the Heart of UA Award from the UA Community Foundation for all his community service. Hello? How's it going? Uh, my name's Rob Littleton. Um, in a minute, I'll take or we'll all go over to uh, the new market to walk it through. I don't think I can do as good of a job of describing it as just going over there and talking about it some more. Um, but um, it's really interesting to to hear the history um, sort of all at one time and realize that like everything we're doing in the market, nothing's really new. It's just an extension of everything that's already been here and a great part of the Upper Arlington community. Um, so I want to thank you know um, uh, Tim and Dan and their families and everybody who's been part of that history um, for making it in a way easy on us conceptually. We didn't have to design a lot of like newfangled ideas. It's just basically going for um, you know we want to be in the same way as both Tarpies and Huffman's, very focused on the community. Um, and the way we did that in the design of the store was to say, okay, well, there are these um, awesome pancake breakfasts, um, you know, parties with Santa and reindeer in the parking lot. And we were like, all right, well, while we have this opportunity and we're doing a lot of construction, maybe we should build something outside that sort of fosters community gatherings like those that have been here since it started. So that's the idea of where the idea of the pavilion came from. So it's, a, it's really a place that allows those kinds of gatherings to be easier. And hopefully we can sort of sprinkle those in um, very often. You know, maybe you know, football games on Saturdays. Um, we'll have all kinds of events going on there, I'm sure. We already have the farmer's market, the UA farmer's market is there. Um, which has been a lot of fun, yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the drum act the other day, but that was great. It was like a, a bongo drums and yeah. <laughs> uh, Marcy who heads up that is really good. Um, so yeah, we wanted to, um, you know, uh, play there, really, you know, um, focus in on that community aspect, but also we're taking a lot of um, advice from um, Tim and Dan and, um, how we interact with the community. We've been, um, 
you know, really present at things like the Golden Bear Bash, UACA, we're doing Neighbors Night Out pretty soon. Um, so all those things we're uh, really, really looking forward to and committed to, and it's honestly tons of fun. Um, and so um, we also want to focus on, you know, I think the same thing that Dan was describing at sort of um, at the, there are things we can do as a community market that the bigger box stores can't do. Um, one of those, the, the biggest is sort of customer experience and um, having people in the store who really thrive on talking to people, teaching them about food, um, just kind of being friends, James knowing people's name. And by the way, James is with us, so that's awesome. It's been great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, yeah. Um, so you'll see James real soon. Um, just to get this question out of the way, um, actually I'll jump into this right now. Um, we're looking at mid-October for opening. Um, we do have to pass our final health inspection for that though. Um, and really we're on track for that, but it relies on a, another step and that's our refrigeration holding pressure for um, over a week. So we, if we get leaks in our refrigeration, we're in, we're in bad shape. So we have to make sure that holds. Then the health department can come in and then we can just roll. Um, into opening so that that process will be a lot of cooking and bringing products in thing, but we're ready to go um, So sorry back to the experience anyway um, Yeah, we want it to be a really welcoming fun friendly community market for everybody um, You know where people know your name and it's just a great place to be um, So yeah, really nothing we're doing is new like I was saying um, same sort of product philosophy has always been there. Interesting, fun products from around the world. Great local products. Um, our overall, the way we look at product um, that's going to be in the store is we want to have the best of the classics um, or the best of the best. So best of the classics, let's say, is Duke's mayonnaise, right? Um, yeah, that's the one I always like to say. It's really good mayonnaise for everyday use. Um, we also want to have healthy, clean, sort of light options for people, and then we want to have fun, new, interesting things. And those could all be one product, or those could be an array of products, but that's kind of one way to view our store. Um, the other thing we're doing, we've really exaggerated the prepared foods part. So once you come in the store, you'll see the kitchen um, and the prepared foods island, and I'll explain that a little bit more once we're in there. Um, so, uh, should I open it up for questions now? Yeah, yeah. If I All right, great. And I'll be leading you guys over, or we'll go over to the market in a few minutes. Yeah. All right, well, we're all going to be headed over to the um, two Littletons in just one minute. I, I want to say thank you again to our presenters for their time today.